Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to our webinar marking International Women's Day. So for those of you who don't know me, my name is Sandra Healy, and I'm director of the Centre of Excellence for Diversity and Inclusion here at DCU. Um, you'll be hearing more from me later on about the project and about the work and, and uh, the different activities and the, and the different panels we have on for you today. But right now, I'd like to pass you over to Professor Derek Hill, President of Dublin City University, who will give the welcome address and formally introduce the Minister. Derek, over to you. Thank you, Sandra, and welcome everybody. I wish there were more people here. I don't know whether you can see out my window. It's a beautiful day here in Glasnevin and uh, all the people and children playing below the window in Albert College Park. I'm sorry that uh, you're not here and we could enjoy it together. Um, welcome then to DCU, Ireland's University of the Year 2021. Uh, I'm delighted to have this opportunity uh, in the week of International Women's Day to celebrate with you and to mark the occasion with our friends from the aviation industry. We had a, a lovely occasion here yesterday where as part of the Women in Walls series we um, unveiled five magnificent portraits of female trailblazers in STEM and of course uh, many of the mathematicians who contributed to space travel. But I think that we could do the same uh, again in another series if we were to celebrate women in aviation. And of course, we would have a few uh, Irish aviators to contribute to that series, including people like Lillian Bland from County Antrim, who apparently was the first woman in the world to design and to construct her own, fly her own airplane, which is a magnificent uh, achievement. But a century later, of course, on from Lillian's time, we still have so much more to do in terms of balance uh, and equality and representation in the aviation industry. And that, of course, is the rationale for this year of inclusion in aviation. Um, this week, just on an aside and kind of looking inwards here, this week provides DCU with an opportunity to examine our own conscience uh, to look at our commitment to equality, diversity and inclusion, but also to see how, as a university that puts people first, uh, how we respond to the equality agenda, to the rights agenda uh, and to the inclusion agenda. Um, we address those values in, in a number of ways. Uh, we're here courtesy, of course, of the DCU Centre of Excellence for Diversity and Inclusion. It's one element of it. Uh, within the university, we have a women in leadership series to grow our own people. We are moving towards greater balance of female representation at the senior levels within DCU. Uh, and of course, as the uh, unique university in Ireland with the Faculty of Education, and I know that Minister Nocton herself uh, began her career as, as a teacher, that we engage with, with young girls uh, at primary level and right through. We have, for instance, a STEM initiative with the Irish Girl Guides. We have partnerships with Lego in terms of robotics. We have a, a, an innovation studio on campus and so on. So in terms of balance for better, uh, put my hand up and say, you know, DC, at DCU, we're not there yet, but we know that. And I think that that awareness is, is, uh, is the key to kind of resolving our challenges. Um, the mission of DCU is to transform lives and societies. And we see the Centre for Diversity and Inclusion at the university, led by Sandra, of course, as a way in which that we can advance the EDI agenda with stakeholders in industry and society. And Sandra and her colleagues have been central to devising this year of inclusion in aviation. We're very grateful to the essential guidance given by the advisory committee. And that advisory board is made up of senior leaders and academic colleagues from DCU Aviation and beyond. Uh, our activity in this space also makes sense because of our academic strengths and our aviation links. Uh, I see some people in the room here, our colleagues uh, who are both students and graduates and faculty involved in our Bachelor of Science in Aviation Management or our Master's in Science in Aviation Leadership. Um, we are, of course, in the shadow of, um, of Dublin Airport, and we look forward to hearing more planes uh, flying uh, over our campus as they did in the past. And we have various uh, partner collaborators around the room who work with us in finance uh, and so many ways. Um, everybody has their COVID stories. Uh, before we came online, people in the groom, green room were saying where we were this time last year. Um, but shortly after the takeoff uh, of the year of inclusion in aviation, 
uh, COVID forced us to make a, an emergency landing. Uh, we were back on the tarmac, back on the apron. Um, it's been an incredibly challenging year for your industry. And my heart goes out to people in the room working in aviation that I think that you've taken the, the brunt of it really. Um, and uh, as an island and the minister I'm sure will address this, the uh, aviation industry connectivity and the management side of it is so massively important to us, and especially for us here in this region, we can feel it in terms of families and students. Um, we are uh, hopeful of a, a, a rapid takeover, takeoff, and for the centre at least, uh, the centre is cleared uh, to take off for the, the resumption of this uh, year of inclusion. Um, it's good to have everybody here. Uh, it doesn't take me but to uh, emphasize the importance of balance and the importance that vital uh, inclusion and diversity is at the heart of that recovery. Um, broader diversity is, is good for everybody. Uh, gender balance improves outcomes for all and I think this is important for the employees, for the customers, for the stakeholders and ultimately for profits. Uh, it's not only the right thing to do uh, from a moral point of view, but it's the right thing to do from a business perspective as well. DCU is passionate about this project and we want to support the industry in, in every way and any way that we can. Um, I'm looking forward this afternoon to hearing about the rebooted year of inclusion, to learn about the latest research on diversity and inclusion in aviation and to learn about new collaborations between the university here, between DCU, the aviation industry, and Skillnet, which of course is Ireland's highly successful lifelong learning programme. And we are delighted that the Minister for Higher Education uh, announcing the strategy of his department yesterday put that lifelong learning and skills development at, at the heart uh, of the government programme. Um, before I hand over to the Minister, I'd just like to thank everybody who's involved in today's event. I'd like to thank the founding partners of the project, uh, especially the advisory committee. And I see some familiar faces around the room. I'd like to welcome my colleagues uh, in DCU in the aviation space and Sandra and her wonderful team at the Centre for Excellence in, for Diversity and Inclusion. I'd like to thank the Department of Transport, Tourism and Sport and in particular the Aviation Division, who have been so supportive of the year uh, of inclusion from, from the very beginning. Uh, and this uh, brings us along to a great pleasure to introduce uh, our keynote speaker today. On behalf of the university and uh, the 114 of us in the room here, I'm delighted to welcome the Minister for State for International and Road Transport and Logistics, uh, Hildegard Nocton. Minister Nocton has been in this role since last June uh, and I want to thank you Minister personally for your support for the aviation industry as it embarks on its post pandemic uh, recovery and journey onwards to success and balance and inclusion. So uh, it's wonderful to have you here with us this afternoon. Minister. Thank you very much and uh, good afternoon everyone. I'm uh, delighted to be here um, addressing you this afternoon. I just want to begin my remarks by thanking DCU for the invitation to, to mark um, International Women's Day. Um, and I intend to be brief because I know um, your time is relatively short and uh, we want to leave more time for your panel of experts and participants to discuss uh, the important issues you have on your agenda today. Uh, and just to apologize at the outset that I won't be able to stay for the entire um, um, session. Um, I know that you had a similar event this time last year in person at that time. and that very shortly afterwards, all of your great plans for making 2020 the year of inclusion and diversity in aviation were interrupted by this terrible virus. And as much as it has been an incredibly difficult 12 months for everyone, it is really important that we have events like this today. Events like this encourage us to be hopeful and to help us to retrain and to and, uh, have a strong focus on our shared future and to push us to make things better in that future. 
the last year has been awful. There's no other word for it and, and no part of our society has escaped that. Um, over the coming period, we need to acknowledge and to strive to repair the terrible economic impact many have suffered in the last year, the social impact on everyone, the educational impact on our youth and the mental health impact, which very few of us have been fully spared. But we need days like today to also reset our commitments to plan for the future and to deal with the important challenge of diversity and inclusion in the workplace. The aviation sector has been devastated, um, as you said, Dara, as a result of COVID-19. Lots of jobs have been lost. Lots of careers have been interrupted or stalled. Lots of businesses are really struggling financially and they're fighting to survive or to hold on. And while there is hope on the horizon because of the availability of vaccines, the sector is facing into a long road to recovery. Against that backdrop, it is perhaps only natural for some to consider inclusion and diversity as less important for the time being. That only the only important thing now is, the, is survival and getting back to where things were at in 2019. But that would be a mistake because too often progress on important issues such as inclusion and diversity is lost because of our response to crisis management. The instinctive rush back to familiarity rather than seeking out new and better ground. And I also think that these issues are often perceived as good times initiatives, almost luxury pursuits rather than being fundamentally important. And that's why today's event and the research work being planned for this year are so important. Inclusion and diversity in the workplace must be fundamental to how we as a society, society operate. They have to form part of our recovery and they cannot be sacrificed because the blueprint for recovery, for our future recovery is peak 2019 or whenever was considered the best of times. It's important that women have both the same access to career positions within aviation and the same opportun opportunities to avail of that access. Research in this area informs the wider diversity and inclusion agenda and examining the reasons why women do not see that as to do not see uh, an aviation career is for them that will feed into the steps that can be taken to address that. Are the barriers social? Are they educational? Are they institutional? These are questions that we need to ask. And when you traveled as a child, if you were lucky enough to have taken flights, um, who did you see? And in what roles did you encounter them? And I'm thinking most children saw pilots as men, cabin staff as women. Is this a factor of a self-fulfilling gender embedding factor? Will our children see the same divisions and not just between genders? Is this one of the reasons for the difficulty in attracting women to careers in aviation? Not just our childhood experiences, but is media a factor? Or is it other social influences, such as our parents, our teachers, and our peers? I do wonder why aviation in particular became so dominated by men. In its early days, there have been pioneers of aviation that happened to be women, some well-known and maybe some not so well-known. Because I'm from the West, I'm particularly intrigued by the story of Sophie Pierce Evans from County Limerick, perhaps more familiar as Lady Heath, a true pioneer of aviation, regardless of her gender, a pilot, a mechanic and adventurer, demonstrated by her flight from Cape Town to Croydon. And I look forward to more stories from women in aviation in the future, highlighting their achievements. I'm aware that research that has been carried out over the years examining stereotype, gender stereotyping, industry imbalance, and looking at the role women already play in aviation, why they chose that career, and what are their experiences. Developing on from this, the research has looked at the reasons why women may not see a career in aviation as an option. The practical implementation of all this research in the form of toolkits that can be used across the industry and in policy development is a real visible output, output that I do encourage. As government and as a minister, I support the measures in place to address gender equality, including the work right across government, the Citizens' Assembly and the financial supports to DCU's Centre of Excellence. However, often those more concrete measures are the the, the simplest, though not easy to address. The less tangible influences are, are where thorough research can come to the fore in directing those resources. 
As policymakers, we rely on that on this research. If even after this pandemic, there is a shortage of pilots, why are we not seeing more women in, in the aviation programs, not just as pilots, but in other aviation careers? Will we see the upsurge in women taking on these traditional male roles when the pandemic dissipates and recovery does happen? I, I do hope so. Society has changed. Equality is to the forefront, but it may not be just the structures that need to change. The tools that research provides are useful examining, in examining all these issues, and those tools can then be realigned to address the wider diversity issues that society faces. While women's growing independence over the last number of decades has redefined the occupational landscape, the imbalance between different industries is now apparent and must be addressed to achieve a true equality of opportunity. The diversity and inclusion challenge is not one for aviation alone. Of course, as a TD, I can see up close that there is a great more that needs to be done to address representation of women and ethnic minorities in, in Irish politics too. Progress on these matters is often frustratingly slow and it doesn't just happen. There are real barriers in many sectors of our economy and society. They can be institutional, cultural and economic bar barriers and they can be deeply embedded and they do not resolve themselves. And what is so wonderful about the research activities being planned for the year ahead under this programme is that it will hopefully shine a light on those barriers as they present themselves in the aviation industry and in doing so, perhaps point to how they can be overcome. And I will end on that hopeful note. And I just want to wish uh, DCU research team all the best for the year ahead. And I look forward to reading your findings later in the year. And you can be assured of uh, the continued support from me and from my department. This is really important work. And uh, I look forward to um, hearing your comments later. And I'll hand you back over to Sandra. Uh, thank you, Minister. And can I say we're, we're very grateful for your support today and for your ongoing support. And it, and it is really important, I suppose, for the for the as the uh, industry uh, recovers um, that we collectively focus on, on what we need to do to, to help uh, the industry get back on track. Um, events such as this are important, as you said, uh, and uh, what we need to be able to do is help the sector to join forces, to collaborate and to plan for the future. And essentially, that, that is what, what today is about. Um, you mentioned that research is fundamental and the first step, and, and we absolutely agree. We need to create that benchmark, that line in the sand, and also to help us identify what are the systemic issues, the structures and the barriers um, that are going to be able to help us uh, build a sustainable uh, aviation industry fit for the future. And can I say that your words today are a testament to the importance you place on diversity and inclusion within aviation, and we very much appreciate the continued support um, of your department. And now I'd like to thank our president, Professor Dara Kyo, for being with us and um, for your ongoing support for the work that we do in the centre. Um, and in particular for, the, from, for this initiative. I know, Dara, you've supported us from, from day one uh, in, in relation to the year of inclusion for the aviation, and we really appreciate that. And now I know you both have to leave. Um, uh, they, they, we will make sure you have access to the recording. I, we have a very interesting panel coming up today, um, but we really do appreciate you taking the time to be here today. So thank you both. As the minister outlined, uh, the the purpose of the Year of Inclusion is to grow knowledge and build awareness around inclusion in the aviation industry. And we're delighted to be in a position to announce the relaunch of our research almost a year ago to the day. Um, I, we were talking earlier that we were in, it was the, the IIA uh, on International Women's Day last year when we announced the research uh, and then we had to press the pause button. Um, but we're delighted uh, to be back today and, and, um, and uh, announcing that we're, we're starting the research again uh, in this year. The aim of the research is to gather data and insights from the industry, and there's two key outcomes. So the first is to create the benchmark, so to create that line in the sand and, and use an evidence-based approach to that. And secondly, is to identify the key focus areas to support the future of work within the industry as it rebuilds. And can I say it would not be possible without the support of our academic colleagues in the aviation management at DCU Business School, in particular, Dr. Marina F. Tamu. We have uh, Dr. Cahill uh, Gilmer, who has been with us and, and is part of our aviation committee, 
and uh, Andrew McIntyre. And also to the master's students from the Implied Research Project um, who are uh, assisting with uh, the, the research. As the Minister has referenced, uh, we aim to launch the research surveys over the coming days. Uh, we will share these with you and our ask is that you please get involved and we ask that you promote the participation among your networks. Uh, there's two parts of the research, so it's it, the same as we had planned for last year. And um, the first is to get a sense of what organisations are doing. So the first part of the research is a focus on data collection um, from the HR uh, uh, practitioners in your organisation for us to get a sense of, you know, around policies and practices and what's happening uh, uh, within your um, within your organisations. And then the second part is for individuals. So whether they're currently working in aviation. Uh, or they work or they have worked in aviation uh, and we will be going out nationally um, to collect that information and finally then our aim is to share the findings of the research in early summer with a report due in september and we look forward to sharing that with you and from that can i just say our commitment is to develop an action plan provide capacity building for the industry in the area of culture diversity and inclusion and um, so as i said you will be hearing more about that over the coming months so now I'd like to turn to uh, the second part of our event today, uh, which is the panel. I can see uh, we have the panel with us today. Welcome. Um, I'm, I'm very much looking forward to this. Uh, firstly, we have Dr. Marina Eftemieu. Uh, welcome, Marina. Um, Marina is going to um, host the panel today. We're delighted to have you with us. Um, so I just have some uh, a brief background on Marina. So Marina is Assistant Professor in Aviation Management and the Programme Chair for the Masters in Management and Aviation Leadership at DCU. In addition to research and lecturing at DCU, Marina is involved in an advisory capacity with a number of bodies across the EU and acts as an expert evaluator for the European Commission. Prior to DCU, Marina held a number of roles in Eurocontrol and the University of West London. Her research has been published in prestigious peer-reviewed academic journals and she delivers executive training for various aviation companies. She's a member of the Air Transport Research Society the German Aviation Research Society and the Hellenic Aviation Society. Welcome, Marina. We also have Julie Garland, CEO, Chief Pilot and Head of Training at Avtrain. Uh, welcome, Julie. We, we were just talking, it, it was, uh, we, were, we were face to face the last time we met um, and I think it's probably well over a year ago now. Captain Garland is a former airline training captain, aircraft maintenance engineer and barrister at law. Prior to Avtrain, she was Director of Compliance for Norwegian Air International. She is an IAA Authorised Examiner for Drones and Founding Chair of the Unmanned Aircraft Association of Ireland. She heads up the team at Avtrain, an IAA approved drone training school currently headquartered in the Guinness Enterprise Centre and expanding globally. Welcome, Julie. Next, we have Fiona Scott. So Fiona is Head of Human Resources at CBD Aviation. Fiona has a strong aviation background and prior to this role, spent approximately 15 years in executive search, recruitment and selection roles within the aviation industry. She's a member of the AWAR Steering Committee, a founding member of Propel Her and a re recipient of the Airline Economics 2018 40 Under 40 Award. Fiona is also a DCU alum. Welcome, Fiona. Next, we have John Drysdale. So John heads up the Shannon Group's International Aviation Services Centre cluster and is responsible for developing and promoting the cluster's activities, primarily in aircraft maintenance and records activity. He's a member of the Propeller Shannon Board, which is a global aviation accelerator scheme funded by Enterprise Ireland and a number of stakeholders, including Boeing and the Irish Aviation Authority. John is an ES, EASA Part 66 Licensed Aircraft Maintenance Engineer and is currently studying aviation business leadership with DCU. He also sits on the Industry Avi Advisory Committee for the Irish Aviation Students Association and is an Aviation Programme Validation Committee member for the Limerick Institute of Technology. Welcome, John. And finally, we have Jane Hoskinson, Director of Talent, Learning, Engagement and Diversity at IATA. Jane has worked across a number of typically male dominated industries, including oil and gas, tobacco and now aviation. Jane is a HR professional whose mission is to inspire people to success. 
In 2019, she established an ambitious target for diversity and inclusion for the aviation industry, 25 by 2025. We're looking forward to hear, hearing more about how that's going, uh, Jane. An initiative that aims to enhance gender representation significantly over a five-year period within aviation. So before I hand you over to Marina, just to say there will be time for questions at the end. So can I ask that you submit your questions through the Q&A box um, and hopefully Marina will have time to put them to the panel. Um, so over to you, Marina. Thank you very much, Sandra, for introducing the panel. It's a great, great pleasure to be here today. So the topic that inevitably dominates the discussion this year is the pandemic. The current COVID-19 pandemic has disrupted the global aviation industry and caused a significant impact on employability and labor. Pre-COVID, the low female representation was already a significant concern for the industry. Here at DCU, we have a growing number of females in our student cohorts, which means that VR bachelor in aviation management with piloting and air traffic control studies, more females will be seeking employment. And VR aviation leadership masters, more females are prepared to take senior management roles. COVID disproportionately affects women worldwide and amplifies the existing gender inequalities. Even while significant efforts have been made to support aviation employees, especially in light of the pandemic, I really wonder, do we sufficiently understand the complexity of the issue? So considering this complexity, we really need rigorous, unbiased, impactful research to help us understand better and resolve this important issue. So in my capacity as a program director for the Masters in Aviation Leadership and academic researcher for the DCU and Aviation Industry Year of Inclusion Initiative, I lead a group of postgraduate aviation students of diverse backgrounds in terms of race, gender, working experience and educational background in conducting in-depth research on gender representation. So with support from the DCU Center of Excellence for Diversity and Inclusion, we focus on attraction, retention and promotion, taking under consideration the pre, during and post COVID situation. I know they're attending this session and I would like to sincerely thank them, but also all our undergrads and postgrads that conduct research on this topic. And they really contribute to the body of knowledge and help us in making the aviation industry more inclusive. We're very much co uh, co counting on the industry for their support with this research, but we're also counting on each one of you in responding and contributing to our efforts. We can enable change. So I believe we are really at crossroads here and we have an opportunity to rebuild aviation while we consider the urgency of enhancing diversity and inclusion. To discuss this and other relevant questions, we are delighted to have a very strong panel here today with a rich and varied background in aviation. So I will start with Julie. So Julie, while we know COVID has created a wider gap in terms of equality for females and underrepresented groups, the sector was already behind in terms of female representation pre-COVID. As someone uh, who has worked in different parts of aviation, how important is it for the aviation industry to make this a priority? And what can be done to support this, Julie? What do you think? Hi, Marina, and thanks so much for being here with the, the, and having me here today. It's fantastic. I really think that, you know, when we look back over the representation of females within the industry, when I started off as an aircraft engineer in, uh, in Erlingus, I was one of two females in the class, and that was, and there was two females in the class ahead of us, and that was out of about 4,000. Um, wow. so, so, you know, things have moved on. If you look at flying and pilots, you've got less than 5% globally that are uh, female represented in, as pilots. Um, if you go on, in, the same rings out across air traffic control, across ground, um, in the cabin as well. So, you know, we really need to, we're missing out on this huge talent pool that's there, that's available to us. When we look at drones, I've got involved now in the drone industry, and there are no barriers to entry for females into the drone industry. It's new, it's innovative, it's, but it's technology based. And out of the hundreds of drone pilots and operators that we've trained, I can count on one hand how many are females. And this is just wrong. We're going to spend the next year now really trying to promote and trying to encourage females into the industry. But this real critical talent stream that we're missing out on, and it's just encouraging people. I mean, we do have ways of encouraging females into the industry, and it just has to start at such a young age. We're missing out on females from such a young age. 
Yeah, thanks, Julie. I, I fully agree with you. Uh, drones is undoubtedly an opportunity for females to be involved in aviation. So, John, I mean, you're based in Shannon, and I know that it has been very difficult 12 months, and the proportion of your colleagues have taken early retirement, as far as I know. So, I wonder, do you feel that women have been disproportionately impacted during COVID? And when it comes to rebuilding, are there opportunities to level this out and attract and promote females? Thanks, Marina, and thanks for having me here today. Um, Shannon, Shannon Group, of course, is an airport. It is also a commercial properties business and a heritage tourism business. So from a, a gender profile, it's actually, it's almost 50-50. We're very lucky. We, we enjoy that kind of healthy profile. And also in our gender pay gap, it, it's quite linear as well. So, you know, signs on when we, we um, looked for volunteer redundancies, we, we don't like to do it, but we did. We had to um, seek out um, applicants for that SIS, that program. And booking the trend, 60% of the applicants were male and 54% of the applicants for our 54% of the successful persons were male. So it's slightly on its, on its head in terms of aviation, but bear in mind, Airports are, of course, a very diverse place. It's got a retail, it's got security. E even in security, for example, we have to have 50-50. That's the way it works. So um, it, it bucked the trend in that sense. But I do know uh, if you go across to the, the MROs, which are traditionally very male orientated, as Julie pointed out, uh, in my class, when I was doing my apprenticeship, there was no women in my class. Uh, although Shannon Airspace at that time had made a lot of efforts, this is back in the, in the late 90, early 1990s, had made a lot of efforts to try and include women into the program. Um, that same company, sorry, the, 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 the MROs here in Shannon uh, have made some progress. For example, one of them recruited their first apprentices, first female apprentices ever um, last year. And that was uh, largely due to a good effort in, a significant effort in getting the verbs right, getting the language right, getting the imagery right, and getting the whole brand of aircraft maintenance to be neutral and not male orientated. They, I know they put a lot of effort into that and I was speaking to the chief executive the other day. So that's had an impact on their business. They, they know it, they know they have to nurture that. They know they're going to have to work hard to retain those individuals and to grow that uh, cohort of, of, of female in the, uh, in the aircraft maintenance piece. Yeah, that, that, that's very interesting. Uh, you have raised some very good poly, points here, John. Uh, Julie, if you don't mind, I will pass back to you because I, I, I'm really wondering. I mean, I know that you have been doing a lot as an individual to encourage uh, young females uh, to join the industry. So I'm wondering, uh, what can we all do to encourage uh, more young girls? Sure, I think it starts at um, at school age, you know, at primary school level, we really need to encourage females and just let them know when they're in primary school that they can do anything. And this is a message that we need to put across, you know, with any parents who are out there really need to be putting this message across. But my grandfather had me in the flight simulator out in Aer Lingus at eight years of age, and that conditioned my entire the rest of my career and my ambitions and what I wanted to do in my career. So primary school is the key target is where we get we get these these young minds that really need to be um, you know, educated in what they can do. Secondary school then, you know, you have things like, I know Jane McGill then and Shannon runs the Girls in Aviation Days and they're amazing, they're brilliant. And I remember when she was running one two years ago, the parents asked, could they come along? And we we're like, of course you can. This has to be focused on the parents rearing children to, to believe in themselves. Um, and, 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 you know, it's, it's projects like that in secondary school as well. And you get then transition year students, you know, industry needs to get involved with transition year projects. Going on then, the third area I would see it is career guidance teachers in school. You know, career guidance teachers need to be educated as to what it is within these different aviation industries that there's such a broad, broad scope of industries that females can get involved in within the aviation sector. It doesn't have to be about being a pilot, being an air traffic controller, being about an engineer. It's about the change, um, how you can go about getting involved in the industry and then change and grow your career throughout the industry. And the fourth area then I would see is in, in the back to work and career change area, you know, is encouraging females when they you know if they do take some time out and they do decide to have children and we can also dramatically improve within the aviation industry um, to encourage females in is actually the maternity benefits if you're a pilot you're immediately that you're pregnant you're grounded and that's it yeah. so there's all of these things this you know you need it at the industry level but you also really need to encourage this from this really really young age and then females really championing the industry and having role models 
for, for younger females to look up to so that we change those gender stereotypes that the, that the minister was talking about. So when you get in, you have two females in the cockpit. Qantas were on the other day that they had airplanes all over the all over um, Australia flying with all female crew on them. And the one comment that was coming back was how difficult that was to arrange, which is terrible yeah. in this day and age. Yeah, Julie, I know. I mean, as a university, many times we have also been receiving emails from career guidance uh, asking information on the career paths uh, that somebody can follow. And uh, we're very much, I don't know if any of them are listening, but we very much want to encourage them to reach out to us. I know that some of my colleagues, uh, they have been doing outreach activities, try to encourage uh, not only females, but also males, everybody to join this exciting uh, industry. And uh, I take also that you mentioned also returning to work uh, policies and also being uh, creating flexible working environments. So Fiona, if you don't mind, I'm gonna jump to you now and I would like you to actually tell me. So you know that so many things have changed in the way we work. And as an HR leader, do you think that the industry can hold into the newfound appreciation for flexible working? Hi, Marina. Thanks for having me today. Well, I sincerely hope that the industry can hold on to it. Um, I think one of the reasons we're so keen to have the day today is to keep DNI firmly on the agenda. And I know there's a lot of statistics that go around at the moment. And I know that one of them that certainly stood out to me was from the McKinsey Women in the Workplace report, mm -hmm. where they were saying staggeringly one in four professional women are actually considering exiting the workforce today, um, primarily due to the impact of COVID. So so, I mean, that is a very, very stark reality. Um, so we do, as employers and as companies, we have to say, what can we do and how can we bring this forward in the best possible way? Um, so we're all experiencing the, the great mass experiment of working from home at the moment with varying levels of success. Um, but it does shatter the myth that remote working doesn't work. Um, it shows it does work. It can be done. It may not be perfect. It may not always be enjoyable, but we can certainly do a lot more in this area than we thought. Um, certainly in Ireland, about 42% of the workforce are currently working from home five days a week. And I think in aviation, there's a, a range of thought on this. I know that a chairman of one of the big banks described working from home as an aberration, um, whereas you know, many other sides of the industry have fully embraced it. Um, and I think I'm optimistic that aviation will actually now move on and adopt a hybrid model. And I think a hybrid model is much more about putting the human element at the center of it. It's much more empathetic. It's much more inclusive. And it will allow women to not self-select out of the workforce and to continue on and take those leadership roles. Yeah, indeed. I think the current situation can act as an opportunity to redesign uh, the working conditions for females and enhance the retention. So Fiona, I'm wondering what type of policies and programs that employers will be looking at at building the right work workplace culture? So there's a lot to look at, and I think the majority of people would agree that a hybrid model is probably what's going to work for them, Marina. And the types of issues that you're looking at overcoming are things like the always on phenomenon where you're blurring that boundary between work and home, um, where you're looking at mitigating the risk of burnout, especially in aviation. It's very fast paced. It's a 24 seven industry. We span multiple time zones. So burnout is a very big risk for our people. And at the moment, people are always worried about like family health and possibly financial concerns as well. So where companies can step in and do some very practical things are around things we don't always think of, like giving um, up to date um, advice on what's happening with the business, the financial state of the business, what you can expect from the business going forward. Uh, one thing we put a lot of focus on at CDB Aviation was annual leave. We can't go anywhere. So you find that people aren't disconnecting and they're not taking that leave. And that's just not good for anybody, the employee or the employer. You see a big increase on health services. And I think a lot of employers are looking to expand their EAP offering, offering things like coaching, um, remote team management, um, how to manage hybrid teams, training their management in order to adapt to that. You see a lot of well-being initiatives. And then also, we will eventually move from working from home to hybrid. So you'll have dual workplaces. And so employers looking to make sure that people are set up for that and geared up for that type of mobility. 
Yeah, that will be very interesting also to see how those uh, policies and initiatives are being implemented in various companies and also monitor uh, their impact uh, towards labor. Uh, so thank you very much, Fiona. I hope the participants are taking notes of uh, all the interesting uh, policies and programs that you mentioned. Uh, so now I'm going to jump to Jane. Jane. I really attended with great interest uh, the IQ event yesterday, where you referred to the IATA 25 by 25 project. So uh, if you don't mind explaining to all of us what that really means, and also what does the future look like now? Is it still possible, and does COVID present any opportunities to rebuild in, in a different way? Yeah, imagine like launching a really big initiative for the industry in November 2019 and saying we're going to make the industry kind of move in the right direction and then the industry literally dies in front of you. I remember in November 2019 we had 27 airlines on a stage in Berlin saying yeah totally committed to getting gender diversity better in in the industry and then three months later uh, you know we were looking at kind of really an existential crisis and 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 you know I would say that that focuses the mind a little bit. Now, I have been really surprised by 25 by 2025. 20, Let me just give you a little bit of background to it. Um, we really kind of sat there in 2019 and said, okay, we can talk about gender diversity all we want, but nothing is moving. And the airlines, they say they're committed, not seeing women in senior roles and you know we know from an IOTA point of view we get criticized on a regular basis here's the board of IOTA and it's all men and maybe there's a woman and maybe there's somebody that's diverse and so we're always in the press where they say you know IOTA has is not connected with the real world the industry doesn't reflect the reality because actually the beauty of this industry is we connect and embrace the diversity of the world. And, and we should be the poster child for diversity and inclusion, and we're not. So, so I remember kind of being in, um, being in uh, South Korea at the AGM and thinking, how can we move it forward? We've got to move it forward. And we came up with this concept of 25 by 2025. Now, ICAO, as you said, Marina, they have an ambition for gender parity by 2030. Mm -hmm. And we looked at kind of the airlines and said, okay, the average number of pilots is between six and 9%. And it's been like that since 1945. How can we move it a little bit? So we said, look, we may not get to 50% and we might not even get to 25%, but let's set some ambitions for the industry. And whilst I'm not a favor of quotas, I am in favor of targets because they help you move in the right direction so we said three things really simple pick an underrepresented group in your airline and either get to 25 percent representation or move where you currently are by 25 percent the same for your senior leaders take a measure of your organization look at the senior leadership and you can define it so the airlines define it themselves we don't tell them what their senior leadership population looks like and get to 25% representation. And then also in our own committees, we say, IOTA is a trade association. We said, we need to have better representation there. So we said, again, same thing, let's move towards 25%. And what's astounded me is we had 55 airlines signed up as the crisis hit. We now have 57 airlines signed up and recommitted. So you wouldn't imagine that through um, a crisis, more airlines would be signing up. But that what I'm really seeing from all of the interactions I have is that people are really putting diversity and inclusion at the heart of the restart of the industry. And so I think it gives us a tremendous opportunity to pivot to do all the things that Fiona says and the amazing ideas about what we need to do to attract more people. And, and Julie's totally right. We've got to get them attracted in the, you know, their first interactions right in the early generations. But we've also got to do our bit to retain and to promote women through the life cycle. So, and that's what this initiative is all about, is making sure that we're not, that we haven't got a leaky pattern pipeline for talent and that we keep people focused in the industry so you know these 57 airlines it's kind of around the group you know and not we don't compete with one another in the talent space we collectively work together to improve the access to talent for everybody because that's got to be a, a good outcome so for me it's really exciting because it's yeah of course airlines compete 
but we bring everyone together to say how can we make this better for everybody yeah Jane I very much hope that all your airlines uh, that they are part of IATA will join this initiative because it's extremely important and as you said uh, I stick to words I mean I like words you, you mentioned the word ambitious so it needs to be ambitious and we need as Julie said we need to attract females we need as John said, to retain females and Fiona uh, to create the conditions for them to thrive and being promoted. So mm -hmm. Going towards more of uh, females getting senior roles. So I'm wondering, what does the future look like for women in aviation and in particular underrepresentation of women at senior level? What are the barriers really? Do we think it's really a pipeline issue? Or are there issues in terms of retention? I don't know, Fiona, or if somebody else wants to take this. I'll kick us off, maybe, Mariana, and then um, whoever wants to, to jump in. Um, I think this is one area where COVID has changed the conversation slightly. And I come back to this idea of one in four women self-selecting and deciding not to pursue their careers anymore and there's a number of reasons why that bothers me um, that bothers me because we're losing today's females in leadership in an industry where we have less than 11 percent at c-suite level so we were already in a challenging position it bothers me because we have future leaders already deciding to step out before they've even started to reach that stage and it also bothers me because when those senior female leaders step out um, all women women throughout the industry are losing their biggest champions and their biggest mentors. Um, so uh, we've made progress slow and steady and, and Jane's initiative is a great example of that over the last number of years. Um, and we need to really make sure now that because of the impact of COVID, we don't reverse all of that good DNI work. Yeah, indeed, Fiona, that's really important. Uh, so what opportunities are there to make things more inclusive? Uh, do employers really consider the, the gender pay gap and equality initiatives? Yeah, the gender pay gap is always a minefield, um, especially with the new reporting requirements that are coming in. And um, Ireland doesn't do particularly well. Uh, we're about 14.4%, like we've all seen the, the stats around International Women's Day. Um, the World Economic Forum are saying that I won't see it in my lifetime, Marina, you won't see it in yours. Our children won't see it in theirs. We're about 100 years away. Um, so it definitely is a big question. And I think there's a number of sides to it. So there's the gender pay gap, but then there's also the wealth gap. So over the course of their lives, women aren't accumulating the same wealth as men are. They're not providing for their retirement in the same age. They're not funding their pensions in the same age. Um, it's actually one of the focuses that we have at Propel Her this year. Um, so we're primarily on the aircraft leasing side. We're sort of a, a, a grassroots group of women who came together to try and support each other and help each other. And uh, we're going to be running some Zoom seminars during the course of the year to look at things like investment for women, personal finances for women, wealth. So there's the employer side of it, and that's hugely important. And I think the reporting will be positive, although it will only apply to companies with over 200 people. So certainly on, on my side in aircraft leasing, that's a very small cohort who are over 200. Um, but then there's also encouraging women to step into that space themselves and take ownership. Yeah, yeah, we really need to push for change. So at this stage, I would very much like to encourage uh, those attending to put their questions in the chat. Uh, my colleagues will be managing and feeding the questions to me. So please put your questions in the chat. Uh, so Jane, one of the questions that is coming from the audience is that uh, you mentioned that airlines are putting diversity and inclusion at the heart of the recovery. Can you give some examples of uh, initiatives or ideas that have been implemented by uh, some of those 70, 57 airlines that joined your initiative? Yeah, I mean, I mean, you you see, you probably saw as well. Some of the airlines did great campaigns yesterday for International Women's Day, and and you know, so some of our some of our members that have signed up to this initiative are, are thinking about exactly the things we're talking about, how to make sure that we get more women back. You know, a lot, as you said, a lot of women were furloughed more frequently. 
than their male counterparts. So they're looking at those kind of systemic issues around how to bring them back into the workplace. I think there's some really great um, programs on entry level programs that some of the um, some of the airlines are putting in place to make sure that they get better representation. So kind of more, you know, and, and this is where it becomes really hard and it becomes really contentious. So, you know, offering subsidies to get more women into the pipeline of talent, you know, which, which then feels kind of unfair because that doesn't feel very equitable, but sometimes you've got to kind of shift the balance to get more people into your pipeline of talent. I think there's a lot of the, um, a lot of our members that we speak to are very, very big on um, mentorship, sponsorship, and female leadership programs to give exposure to leaders because we also know that sponsorship becomes very very important as you move up to those senior levels so creating structured sponsorship programs where women get exposure to do the to the, do these roles you know and and we also know that because we don't have many women in the pipeline they don't tend to get to the senior levels and then you go to this default position of well i give the senior position to uh, give cfo and head of hr to a woman well that may not be right either so you know kind of really thinking about how do you make sure that you're properly getting kind of diversity into those senior level roles and making sure that women get exposure to the senior roles in kind of um you know engineering in operations um and and addressing things like that so every um just as a kind of side note all of our um signatories are coming together on friday we're having our session on friday and we'll start to be publishing and sharing best practice so you know i will keep in touch with uh, sandra and the team because once we start to share those best practices they will become available for everybody so we can you know we can all leverage the benefit of their initiatives thank you so much jane uh, john i mean before you mentioned the difficulty in retaining talent, uh, we are all very optimistic and uh, also the, the leaders in aviation, they're very optimistic and they're saying that it's not going to take that long for the industry to recover. Uh, taking from what you said, I think there's going to be a real fight attracting talent. So I'm wondering how does gender comes into that? We will be able to attract talented females. So yeah, one of the working examples that we would have here is, um, you know, big business being able to attract women into into the the working from home role. So for example, we lost one of our key persons to just that. They got the dream job in an organisation with a big budget, um, and they, we lost them from our company because we were we of course were in, in the office. That's what how we work. So, you know, as a business, we would have to look at that and how we how we go forward and attract. Uh, people into our business. I will say this, um, today there's no flights, no fly, passenger flights from the airport. So one of the interesting things in one of our very recent recruitment campaigns was that that a senior role, it was quite attractive, an airport was quite attractive to, to individuals because you're starting off with that ground zero space that you could really use that as a brand to, to, uh, um, to your CV. So hopefully that's, um, I don't know the outcome of that uh, campaign, but we, you know, it does enable um, that you can you can attract people from outside the immediate region into your business. That they can go for a hybrid working arrangement. A lot of our staff are working hybrid as it, as it is from Galway and from Cork. Um, so we want to you know really develop uh, develop that. I think that's the opportunity there. Yeah, thanks, John. Julie, I mean, you, you're undoubtedly very successful. Uh, I think you have been mentoring a number of females. If you had three top advice to share with all those women listening to us now, what would that be? Believe in yourself. This is the one thing that we get with females all the time is the self-doubt, is imposter syndrome, is all of these things that seem to be ingrained in females from, from the, the time when they're young um, and that they already they assign themselves gender stereotypes. So, you know, we need to break down those barriers. And I, and I was really interested in what we were saying earlier on when the minister mentioned about, you know, walking into an airplane and the, the, you know, the cabin crew are females and the pilots are males. And, you know, unless we get this really dramatic change and females are always going to see this as these gender stereotypes. So breaking down gender stereotypes, but I think 
really the most positive thing is is applying. The other thing that's really interesting when this comes up is applying for jobs, applying for roles. Uh, females will look and make sure that they fit the criteria and they will go down and they will say, no, I don't meet that. So I won't apply for the job. Apply for the job. Do you know, go and get the job, you know, like and, and the practice that you'll get even in doing that is, 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 is so enlightening even to a female, even if they don't get the job, it's putting in for these things. A male will look at a, at a, at a list and things and go, well, I meet one of them and, and the salary is good so I'll apply for it do you know a female will go no I don't meet it so it's about encouraging these things but I do think and I just wanted to touch on a point that that Jane made earlier on about gender quotas and gender and gender targets and I mean I could not support gender targets more and I think females who are in senior roles now really need to females and males in senior roles really need to be looking at these but it's all about the application rates there is no point in us saying we want 50 percent we want parity we want all of these things unless 50 percent of the applicants are there we cannot take 50% of applicants of 50% of, of candidates from 3% of applicants. So we really need to encourage that. But what I just say to females is go for it. Do you know, do not be held back in any way by the fact that, you know, do not consider in any way that the fact you're a female, use all the advantages that we have as being females and use all the advantages that we have as being humans, you know, just go for it. Uh, so that would be my top, my top one would be go for it. Julie, I very much hope that my students are taking some notes here. <laughs> <laughs> because that's great advice that you serve. Go apply for the job, believe in yourself and just do it. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So we have a question here from one of our delegates, which I find very interesting. Um, so mainly we have seen a number of initiatives, we have seen a number of targets. So are those really a tick box exercise or are the companies really trying to implement an organizational change, a change of culture and uh, uh, attract, retain and promote females? So what do you think? Is it just tick box exercise or does it really work? Can I, could I just jump Please. in on that, Marina? Just, um, I just want to go back to my own personal experience. I mean, when I got my job in Aer Lingus, when I first started working as an aircraft maintenance engineer, I did meet somebody on the hangar floor who told me that if I had have ticked another few boxes, then maybe I would have, um, you know, I would have been able to tick another few boxes. And I think that attitude has changed. I really hope it has. And I'm not, you know, I know certainly within the, that organization, it most dramatically has because they're very much trying to encourage female talent in, particularly in the roles of pilots where they ran a scheme themselves specifically. Gen and, but it is, I think this comes, females can be their own worst enemies as well, holding back other females too and, in, and, and not encouraging other females. So I really think the, the, the way forward is that um, these the, the issues that were there in the past, we need to leave them in the past where they belong and we need to move forward and we need to allow companies to grow and blossom and to encourage females in and that they're not just carrying out box ticking exercises, that they are really, really encouraging females into different roles. Um, they're not, it's not box ticking. And we also need from our male colleagues point of view of if somebody, a female does get a role that we need to cut this out of, oh yeah, well, you got it because you're a girl because that is so prevalent in across every industry, nothing to do with ABA but across every industry so we do need to take that away that that you know this encouraging females into roles and then when females do get a role that there's this little background noise about oh she's a girl yeah good point Julie Jane you have been working with a number of companies now so me personally I'm really wondering how can companies change a culture that, that it took them years to develop uh, how is it that how is it done how can airlines do it uh, so you know probably not going to say anything that will surprise anybody it has to genuinely start at the top and and that's where i think we end up in this kind of it's either a ticks a, a box ticking exercise because the ceo says yes that looks like a good thing to do and as soon as they start to think that then it's a box ticking exercise if they genuinely see the benefit, and this is why I love the reports from McKinsey um, that show the correlation between diversity and business performance, you know, and this is really important. This is what, how we appeal to kind of CEOs of airlines. One of the biggest growth areas out of the pandemic is solo female travel, right? And if you think about that, and couple that with who are the decision makers for family-based travel, it's often the females. So if airlines aren't filled with people that are making decisions about products, delivering service that are female friendly or friendly to a kind of diverse population, 
then they're just simply not going to make as much money. So as soon as a CEO gets that in their mind and says, well, this makes business sense and I am going to lead it and I am going to lead it from the top, then you see change. So, I mean, I my role model was Christopher Luxon, who was the CEO of Air New Zealand. He was He was literally the guy that threw the gauntlet down to me and said, what are you going to do about actually moving the industry forward? And, you know, what they did in Air New Zealand was excellent. He got it. Equally, I see a number of CEOs that philosophically get it, but they don't really get it and they don't really know what to do and they don't really role model it. And then they've lost the whole of the organization. So, you know, I think that it has to come from those senior leaders. And whilst we can put lots of pressure on, and that's the right thing to do is to continue to exert pressure upwards, the minute that you really wanna make the cultural change, you get the CEO behind it and then everything falls into place. Okay, yeah. So uh, one of the first events that we did with the, the Center for Diversity and Inclusion is elaborating on the business case for having a diverse working environment. And I think it's really critical and utmost importance that leaders understand that it's not only just acting or looking nice, it also has a business case for having a diverse working environment that works and promotes females, but also looks at beyond gender. So uh, that's also a big part that we plan to include in our research, the business case, the need, uh, evidence-based need for a diverse working environment. Uh, we have a, a question here for Fiona. Uh, so Fiona, can you please expand on the proposed initiatives regarding employers? Sure. Um, so obviously every employer will have their own path and I'm very conscious that there's very different roles within aviation. Um, so we're fortunate enough that we can do an awful lot with remote working and our entire um, company across the world is working from home at the moment. Um, for others where it's much more on-site work, then people are probably going to have to look more so at the tasks and what has to be done remotely and what doesn't. But I think the main thing is that people don't assume that the same processes and procedures will continue as we move into the hybrid world. So encourage employers to think along the lines of how will our processes change how will our workflows change what you want to avoid is the creation of like a second class um class system like a second class level of society almost within the company where people who are physically present in the office perhaps are spending more time with the leadership are getting promotion preferences are getting reward preferences and people who are working from home aren't involved in those decisions and aren't getting the same opportunities um, so it's for companies to look at how do meetings take place do they give preference to the people who are on site or are they fully inclusive? How do decisions take place? Does it end up being the people who are in the office making the decisions or are you extending those processes across the company? What about performance management? So less about how many hours are you clocking up and more about the outcomes. So there's no one size fits all, but putting the thought into it at the beginning, Marina, when you move to the hybrid model and not simply saying, oh, well, some people will be in the office and some people will be at home. I think that's what's going to make the difference for people. Yeah, thanks, Fiona. John, you, in your experience working for an airport and being involved in MRO, uh, do you see similar initiatives working uh, for this part of the industry? So I do, you know, the um, our business here in commercial properties, for example, and in the management of the airport is, is quite hybrid. But to pick up on Fiona's point, it is critically important that we watch that two tier organization piece where, you know, decisions are being made by the people inside the office, the informal organization up and down the corridor here versus those who are working at home and isolated. And I think that's something that organizations need to be particularly careful of uh, to include people like that, because inevitably, I guess it'll, uh, it'll be a majority of women who are doing that role. Um, so again, we just we would have facilitated it up to now. So if you wanted it to work that way, that's fine. But moving forward, that is how we're going to be working from now on. Uh, so to, to really look at it, not as a, an inconvenience, but as something we have to adopt completely across the organization, but particularly that piece of the two-tier organization that we watch out for that. Mm. John, you as a male, do you see yourself? I, I, I'm, I'm, it's a personal question this now, so I apologize from the beginning. Do you see yourself as male being a mentor for a female? Do you see that working out? That's a good question. Um, it's, it's happened. Um, I, I've been very lucky, uh, Marina, throughout my career 
in that apart from the first round of my class, I've always had female as part of my team, be it I'm a member of the team or a supervisor of the team. Uh, and right through up to this day, uh, Shannon Eask, the Aviation Services Centre, is the team of two, and it's myself and Rita. So, you know, um, as I progress into the stage of the career that I have now, inevitably you do. Uh, I know some of Julie's clients, for example, were on the phone to me about about drones and how training will how can they get into that industry and is it is it difficult is it technically challenging it's not at all you know so um i i do end up in that role to a certain amount um and i that's fine with me yeah john i have to correct you on something you're not lucky it's that they approach you because you're kind thoughtful and knowledgeable and always willing to help out uh, <laughs> <laughs> so, Julie, I mean, you have been in various working environments, uh, uh, you have a vast experience in all of this. So I'm wondering, do you think that typical masculine networking events in aviation can act as a, an institutional barrier for women to succeed in aviation? Um, certainly, yes, I do. Um, the traditional thing is um, is is going to the pub, going to somewhere to drink large quantities of drink, and whoever's left standing at the end of the night gets the job or gets the role or gets, and and that's traditionally been how the aviation industry has operated. Um, you know, for sure. I mean, and I think it, but it goes back to, and also the, the 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 casual sexism that goes on, particularly in an office environment, particularly in where we are back to a, an actual workplace. I think removing this and. I just saw I saw another um, I saw another question there from Amelia as well actually and just wanted to just very touch on it as well. So so yes, I absolutely think that that networking, the way we have networking, I do think that this that if we can go to the pandemic having any positive, you know, this whole environment of networking now online and actually that's it, this is becoming a norm. And I do think that's going to improve overall how people communicate with each other, how people get and remove that environment of you know, alcohol for starters being a being a being a you know a, a norm, and um, and that that people can be and at networking events they can be much more open to males and females. It's not somebody at home trying to get a babysitter involved that they have to stay out late at night and all of these things. So I think that that yes, I think the the pandemic has put paid to some of that. I think there's much more of an awareness of people when they are networking now that networking can be done in very different ways and be successful. Um, but one of the points that Amelia made there, and I just wanted to touch on it as well, is that about the um, males being role models. And this is so important about that this is not about females holding and helping other females. It's about across the board, across, across the industry. And I remember being at a talk that Amelia was giving and she talked about females pulling up the ladder behind them sometimes as well. And that can be another phenomenon that happens so we need to make sure that across the board that we're encouraging females to progress within an industry, within an environment, within the office and remove casual sexism from the office as well. And I think that goes a long way towards educating the male environment as well as the female environment as to what casual sexism is within the office environment, because these become bars to entry. These are things that females are hearing on a day to day basis and it becomes ingrained and there becomes a level of acceptance across both male and females for casual sexism in, in particularly in an office environment. Environment. So I think just encouraging and pointing that out. A lot of the times, if you point out something out to somebody, they didn't even realize what they were doing in the first place. And I think that could go. It's really it's, it's about education um, and educating people on um, on how to go about encouraging females and encouraging females into these roles. Yeah, Maureen, and let's just add to that as well about, um, you know, one one group that I really think are most important in this dialogue. And I, I you know, I'm really happy that we are a mixed group if from a gender perspective is as soon as it's women just talking about women, about women is issues, it becomes an echo chamber. And that's why I'm a massive fan of Male Champions of Change, which was um, pioneered or at least kind of spearheaded by Alan Joyce, who's who is the CEO of, um, of Qantas. And they will do really, really simple things like they won't appear on a panel if there's no women. They won't internally make recruitment decisions unless it's a recruitment panel that is kind of diverse. So the male champions of change are just as important as kind of setting targets. We've got to, we've got to approach it on multiple prongs because it's important to kind of have allies and role models. And, and sometimes you don't know how to show up as a role model. So, so, you know, I recommend to anyone that's interested, any of our kind of male allies out there, go and check out Male Champions of Change because they really give you very practical ideas of things that you can do as a leader to really help support this in a very practical way. 
Very good point, Jane. I think it's also the time to thank both males and females who are attending this event and also those who are going to attend the recording. We're really grateful uh, that you became part of this. Definitely, gender representation is not a woman's thing. It's both uh, a gender thing. And obviously, gender, we are touching on gender because that's the most critical part, uh, considering that half of the population uh, or around half of the population is affected by that. But it's obviously something bigger, diversity and inclusion. And definitely it does include uh, race, um, mixed back minorities, uh, backgrounds, ethnic groups, and uh, groups with the disabilities or uh, everybody really. So we are we are running out of time, unfortunately. Uh, I think we could have kept going with this discussion for even longer. This is a, a very important issue for the industry and at DCU we remain committed in assisting the aviation industry with rigorous research and practical advice. So thank you very much all the, the, the panelists who shared their experience and gave some practical tips and uh, ideas and share their views. So thank you, Julie, John, Jane and Fiona for such interesting uh, insights and thought-provoking discussion. Thanks also to the attendees for your questions and joining us today. And now I will pass you back to Sandra uh, for the concluding remarks of this webinar. Sandra. Thank you, Marina, and thank you for what a fantastic panel. I agree, I think we probably could have gone on for another hour. Um, what I will say is we've received lots of questions and can I just say that we will, we will I think pro probably what we'll do is save them and publish them and we might put it to the panel um, and and uh, just get your responses to that because there's some very important points being raised. Um, just before I close out, I'd like to just take a moment to thank our supporters and um, the work we're doing uh, within the Center of Excellence and the Year of Inclusion would would not be um, uh, uh, would not be possible without our advisory committee. Um, so we have representation from leaders across industry, from government, from the representative bodies, and from academia. Um, and we're very fortunate to have their continued supports and, and insights and they guide um, the work that we do. And um, we're extremely grateful to our founding partners. So we have AMCK Aviation, Aer Lingus, Dublin Aviation Authority, KPMG, and the Aviation Division within the Department of Transport, Tourism and Sport. I'd also like to mention the team at, to, at Aviation Skillnet and, and thank you for your support uh, as we move forward to implementing training and capacity building within the sector. And the Centre of Excellence will be working with the industry to develop a diversity and inclusion workshop series. Uh, we'll be working with Fiona and Propel Her and ALI. And, and essentially our focus there is around building capacity and building supports, and in particular a peer network uh, uh, across uh, the industry. And, and they are some of the key points I think that came out today. So um, we will continue focus in that area. And finally, I'd like to thank you, our attendees. Uh, we're thrilled to see such a far reaching interest uh, on, in this initiative. I, I think we have full attendance at every one of our events. Um, I, I'm getting a sense that we probably need to do them more often. Uh, we hope that this event has provided you with interesting insights on the importance of keeping DNI on the agenda. And most importantly, that you take this knowledge into the ongoing planning and the strategy discussions that are taking place within your organizations at the moment around how the, how the industry rebuilds and starts to uh, move forward. So now I'm going to leave it there. If you have any questions, any additional questions or any ideas or thoughts or comments, please feel free to make contact with us in the Centre of Excellence. Uh, and I wish you all the best. Thank, thank you for your time and enjoy the evening. And thank you to our fantastic panel. Thank you. Thank you.